My favorite thing about Refresh is being with the body of Christ. Everything for me is better when we're together. The worship's better, my faith is stronger, and everything comes alive in the Word to me. Go! That's what you get for trying to have nice shoes. <laughs> it was totally worth it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, good morning. It's a real privilege to be here. Lindsay, that was outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. I, I feel like she cued me up perfectly for this session I'm going to share um, with you this morning. And I really have an expectation that the Lord has an agenda among us. You know, he's always working in us, but there's something happens when we come together that gives the Holy Spirit an opportunity to do something among us. And I think that's what he has planned today. So a few, oh, actually it was six or seven years ago at Refresh, I had the opportunity to pray for with on the ministry team. And a woman came up to me and she said, would you pray for me? I just have this fear of not being enough. And I had never heard that language, believe it or not, and I was kind of taken aback by it. Um, so we prayed. She gave me a little bit of background on it. And I went home that day, and I thought a lot about that, not enough. And I just started to ask the Lord, because as I started talking to the Lord about it, it was coming up everywhere, women all around, just not feeling enough. In fact, what are the words on one of the most popular songs right now? The Lauren Daigle, you say? I'm going to read it because I, have you ever tried to say the songs, the words of the song? It's impossible. You sing it. Y'all don't want me to do that. <laughs> it says, I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single line tells me I will never measure up. And on this journey with the Lord, I realized that her story was mine. I was feeling not enough in almost every area of my life, and it was driving my life. And so I told the Lord, I've had enough. This cannot drive my life anymore. I said, enough. And that's how this story began. So I've been living this journey for six or seven years, so I laughed at myself when I told myself I didn't feel prepared. The Lord said, you've been preparing for this message for six years, <laughs> so you're ready. Um, before I get go into what the Lord showed me, I just want to define enough so we make sure we're talking about the same thing. Obviously, enough can mean had it, fed up, sick and tired, up to here. That's where I was. <laughs> it also means, now, this is what was interesting to me. Enough to me always meant just, just to get by. But actually, when you research this word, it's an abundance, a full measure, complete and acceptable. That's actually how enough is defined. And that's what um, I want us to keep that in mind when we're talking about this today. And of course, not enough with this young lady or this beautiful woman. She's now become a friend, and I've seen the Lord, what the Lord's done in her life um, experience. She walked up to me that day and says, I feel, what she was saying is, I feel inadequate, insufficient, and lacking. And that was my story. I didn't realize it, but that was driving my life. So... I began a series of questions with the Lord. I said, Lord, what's going on with this not enough? I want to know, and I want it out of my life. And he instantly gave me a picture from um, Scripture. In the Old Testament, there's a Scripture that says, the Lord hates unjust measures. So back when they didn't have technology like we do, they would have a scale, and whoever was in charge of, say, at the market when you were buying something, they had a pouch, and they put a a stone on this side of the scale, and then as they measured the flour or anything, when they became equal like this, they knew that they had a just measure. Well, a lot of times the reason the Lord hates that is because they would put unjust stones in there and they would cheat the people. And so I just got that picture of it, of an unjust measure. And I had to realize then at that point, you can't have an unjust measure until you're comparing two things. So it was, the Lord just spoke to me and goes, it's in comparison that is driving these feelings of not enough. It was rooted in comparison. And of course, that 
really resonated with me. I understood that. I was comparing myself in just about every area of my life. Let me define comparison for you. It's an eva it's evaluation, a measure, a noting of similarity or dissimilarity between two or more things. Comparison always produces a value of something. You've got one, this is valued at this, and this is another. And you have some possible outcomes when you do a comparison. There can be less than, equal to, or greater than. Those are your three possible outcomes on a comparison. And when we compare, oftentimes, often, for a lot of us, not everyone struggles with this, but many women do, we come out on the less than side. We come out on the not enough side of the equation. Um, and I have to say, it's not just us comparing ourselves with someone else. Sometimes we're comparing our spouse with another spouse, and they're coming up on the less than side. Or we're really comparing our children with other people's children, and we're feeling like they're coming out on the less than side. So any comparison that lands with somebody not enough is not a healthy comparison. I don't have a problem with comparison. There's comparisons in our world that are helpful to us. It helps us learn, um, understand things, but the comparisons that end with a less than or a greater than are not healthy. And think about the greater than. If you land on a, if you do a comparison and you land on the greater than side and they land on the less than side, well, that's just pride and that's not what the Lord wants in our lives either. So comparison, if it's a less than or a greater than, is not healthy. So what are some areas that we tend to compare? If I was to, I wish I could, y'all could shout it out, but just think for a minute. Areas that women tend to compare. Um, our looks, Lindsay mentioned that a minute ago. We tend to compare, pardon me? Education, Education definitely. Spiritual maturity, a uh, good one. Our ministry, we all, we know we all call to bring the sphere of influence into this world. We'll compare that. Salary, status, stuff, IQ. A lot of women. Pardon me, what'd you say? Talents. I mean, the list goes on and on. We compare in almost every area of our life. And... For me, I think the reason the Lord gave me this message is because it was overtaking my life. It may not be overtaking your life. It may just be one or two areas. It doesn't matter. All comparison that lands, lands with us feeling not enough must go. The Lord's provided a way for it to, for it to go. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I will tell you, there's a... Um, in, when you're studying scriptures, there's something called the law of first mention... And it's an interesting concept. So you take a topic or a thing and you go and you find your, the first example of it in Scripture. And there's something there. There's this, a little bit of extra weight on it there. So I asked the Lord, I said, where's the first comparison in Scripture? Would you show me? And actually, it's in the garden. The enemy was talking to Eve and he put something in her mind. He says, God's withholding you. He, didn't, he doesn't say that. As he's withholding with you. Because he knows if you eat from that tree, you will be like him. So it set her up feeling less than. She felt like she had now been less than. It's an interesting thing that it started right from the beginning. That it was set up that way. So before we move on, you've all got books or something or put it in your phone. I want you to identify at least or just one, the biggest area, if this is a problem with you, if this is something that's you're dealing with in your life, I want you to just identify one area in your life in one or two words, and I want you to write it down on that piece of paper. Wasn't hard, was it? <laughs> Here's where we're going today. We're going to take a few minutes and we're going to look at the fruit that this kind of comparison. We said it's not enough, but it actually is. Um, we can look into that in detail. So we're going to look at the fruit of comparison. Then we're going to talk about the root of comparison. 
And then the good part, the remedy, because the Lord has provided a remedy. Well, I put together this graphic to help us understand just how comparison works. It's the cycle that we get into. So we have the comparison, and I didn't put all, all comparison, but I felt like it. But so I'm going to say, because I'm careful with alls and every and nevers, but I'd have to say most comparisons lead to an accusation. If you've got an accusation, there's been a comparison first. And I'm talking about unhealthy comparisons. And things about that, I, I can't say all accusation begins with a comparison because I'm sure somebody could think of one, but I had a hard time thinking where these wrong comparisons did not land in an accusation. And you know what's funny about that is because a lot of time these accusations do have these elements of truth in it. You kind of do see maybe you're not measuring up to who you're comparing your to, yourself to. It's not like you're not crazy. It, it is, there is a little bit. But here's what you have to remember. And Lindsay touched on this, which I love. Her scripture was better than my scripture, so I'm going to use hers. <laughs> Don't compare. <laughs> <laughs> so even though there's those senses of, yeah, I, I'm not that, and those little senses of truth in that, it says an accusation, that the scripture she said is the enemy has been stripped of his power to accuse us. He is called the accuser of the, brother, of the brethren. The gospel made a way, and I, by the way, the only thing the enemy speaks in is lies. Every accusation is a lie, but he's been stripped of that power. But you say, well, Robin, kind of looks like maybe this accusation is true. God made a way for the accusation to be canceled through the blood of Jesus. It doesn't mean we just go and do whatever we want because every, every time we mess up, the Lord covers it. It's just saying he has no more power to accuse us. So any comparison that leads to an accusation is illegal. I'll read my scripture since I'm not supposed to compare. <laughs> he says, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blameless, I mean without blemish and free from accusation. He, he has no right to accuse you anymore. Now, the accusation comes, let's say, and I spent a lot of time believing those accusations. But actually... They have no power until you agree with them. An accusation can come and you can cut it off right then, but it's when we agree with it that gives it its power. Praise God, the truth, the opposite of that is always is, is true as well. The truth we believe, we empower. So when we start to agree, so the agreement is the third part of the cycle, when we start to agree with this accusation, now it begins to define us. And we start to see ourselves that way. And it leads to this. And this is where I lived, right here. To the area I'm going to do better. I'm going to try harder. Whatever was... I my sister was... Man, she was my comparison. She was a couple years older than me. About the time in life when you're starting to really kind of pay attention about who you are. I was in sixth grade. She wins this most beautiful contest at school. I'm like, huh, didn't think much about that. And then a couple of years later, and she was very popular with the boys, obviously, um, very smart. And a couple of years later, we're both graduated, and um, she starts off on this career track that just blows me away. So this became a, a very sensitive area for my life. I was constantly comparing and measuring my career to her career. And that will lead you... And I began to feel less than, not enough, and that leads you into trying to do better. And I call it the four P's. I went into pleasing, perfecting, producing, and performing. This was the, this what drove my life. Because if I could, didn't measure up, by golly, by the sweat of my brow, I was going to measure up. I was going to do better. But what happens when you're trying to do it in your own strength? I'm, not, I'm all for 
accomplishments and things like that. But what is it when you're trying to do it in your own strength? It leads to what? Burnout, exhaustion, frustration, hopelessness. Just a, it's a, not a fun place to live. And so the cycle starts all over again. You're trying to do better in your own strength. Not, you fall short, another comparison comes, and now you're on the hamster wheel, I call it, of comparison. It just goes on and on. So I want it off. And let me tell you, the gospel has a solution for every part of this, every single one. We talked about how we can, um, the gospel does away with accusation. We can shoot. What if we have agreed with it? The gospel still provides a way. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can take those lies and replace them with the truth. Doing better, this is the message of the gospel. We've been called to rest in him and let him work through us. I, I love, love accomplishing things. I really do. But when you, and we've all been given good works to do. It said in Ephesians 2.10, 2, before um, the foundation of the world, that he knew us. And then in Ephesians, it said he had prepared good works in advance for us to do. But when those good works are done, trying to per perfect and please and perform, they just become dead works. And that's not what God had planned for us. He wants to partner with us so that the fruit on our life comes from our union with him. So the gospel will handle every area of this treadmill. But here's what I asked the Lord. I said, I want off the treadmill. I don't want to have to manage the treadmill every day. So I asked him, I said, what's the root? Will you show me the root of this situation? Because that's what I want to go after. I want comparison out of my life. Because I've been told a thousand times, don't compare, and I was still doing it. So I asked him, and he said, Robin, your desire to feel valuable and significant is driving comparison. That was the root issue. We all want our life to matter, and we should, because it does. But if a sense of value and significance comes from how well we perform, it will never be enough. Never. It will never be enough. It's not our accomplishments that make us significant in value. It's his accomplishments. Somehow, I had this wonky, worldly perspective. I don't know where I got it, of significance. And the Lord told me, he says, Robin, you need a heavenly perspective of significance. He says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Romans 8, 16. Our spirit is testifying that we are valuable and significant. We are his masterpiece, a work of art. We are not a piece of work. And that's what I felt like. I am a piece of work, and I have got to get this figured out. We are trying to work ourselves into something we already are. Um, if we cut comparison off at the root, we get off the hamster wheel. This is an important thing. We want off the hamster wheel. Just this week, a friend of mine sent me her resume. She goes, listen, I'm about to submit this. Would you look it over? Remember the whole career thing when I was younger with my sister? I said, sure. And I've, I've not worked with her. I've been in ministry with her. I am extremely um, love what she brings in a ministry perspective. But I didn't have any idea what she did in a... Um, careers. So I get a resume and I'm opening up and I'm starting reading it and I can feel this rising. I mean, it was impressive and it's like I had one foot on the hamster wheel. You know? <laughs> I was ready to jump on because this was an impressive resume and I was doing the comparison thing. Um, and I, stopped, I was able to stop myself because the Lord has brought me to a place where I understand my significance and value, and that's where we're headed on this. We're going to talk about the remedy. We want to take comparison and pluck it up at the root. Listen, listen to Luke 17, 6. And this is not on the slide. It says, The Lord said, If you had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, 
You might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it will obey you. I don't know about you, but I'm sick of mine. Are you sick of yours? <laughs> I want to pluck it up at the root, cast it into the sea, and it will obey me. So here's what the Lord said. I said, what's, what's the remedy, Lord? And he said to me, as clear as I'll never forget where I was sitting. He says, Robin, it's impossible to compare one. I said, what, what do you mean by that, Lord? I knew there was something there. Remember when we defined comparison? It's a value between two things. He says, you need to, t you need to really investigate in my word what it means to be one with me and one with the body. Our oneness, it's our life union, keeps is the remedy for us comparing to one another. If I find... If in, in you I find my worth, in you I find my identity. Remember that from that same Lord, Lauren Daigle song? Well, I, wanna, I couldn't believe it, so I was thinking, I know identity is always part of what we're talking about. So I went to the dictionary and I said, Lord, I need a new word for identity. I want a new word for identity because um, we've heard it so much, it's so important, but I want to say it a different way. And I went to the dictionary, and guess what the word was? The definition oneness our identity is oneness oneness with him one body one spirit one mind God's plan all along has been to make us one if you read John 17 this is the prayer Jesus prayed the night before he went to the cross go read it you know what's on his mind one oneness Lord make them one as we are one Lord I've shown them your love so they can be one. Lord, I've made them one so the world can see. It's oneness is the Lord, was the Lord's plan to stop this comparison. Let's look at the scriptures. And there's so many. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Don't you realize that together you have become God's inner sanctuary? And the Spirit of God makes his permanent home in you. God's inner sanctuary is holy, and that is exactly who you are. I want to talk to you just a little bit about the second scripture. Don't you realize that you have become God's inner sanctuary? In the temple, there was the outer courts, the holy place, or I forget the... Y'all probably know it better than I do. But the most holy place was the center of the temple behind the veil where the Ark of the Covenant was. It was the most holy place. In Scripture, the word for it, it was N-A-O-U-S, noos, something like that. And that is the word used here. God has deemed us the most holy place. This just blew my mind. We'd, it see, almost feels irreverent a little bit to me when I first thought of it. But that's who he says we are. We are the most holy place. And the reason we are is because he came and gave us life union with him. That's how we can be the most holy place. The Holy Spirit came and took up residence in us. When we were born again, we were crucified with Christ we were submerged in the body of Christ, sealed by the Holy Spirit, and he came and took up residence in us, and we became one with him. We are the most holy place. And how much more significant and value can we get than to be deemed the most holy place? And it's all because of our union with him, what he accomplished, not what we accomplish. Our significance is a relationship, not our accomplishments. He longs for us to see our significance from his point of view. I will tell you this. When this revelation started to just percolate in me, and I began to see myself just so humbled that this is who we are, that we're now the most holy place. The veil has rip, been um, ripped. We have full access to the holy place, and he calls us his temple. When he says, you are the temple 
of the Holy Ghost. He's saying, you're the most holy place. You are where my spirit resides. I was thinking about that one day, and I had this issue that I, I had a, a situation going on, and I, I just had a, a narrative in my head that just was not godly. It just was not, it, just didn't, it was just not helpful. And I knew it wasn't, but it, it was a bad situation. It was, the thoughts were kind of feeding the old flesh. And the Lord says, um, that doesn't belong here. And I'll never forget that. I said, you're right. That doesn't belong here. Those type of thoughts don't belong here. And so anytime those start to come up again, I just say, wait a minute, that doesn't belong here. I'm not going to think that way. I'm not going, it's just not who I am. I think to note to, it's a very, for me, a life-changing revelation that the Lord sees me and you valuable enough to make us the most holy place. And it has to be one, for one, only one way that he can do that. And then that's through his, our union with him. This is the great mystery that he's talking about. Remember the, the husband, the man shall leave his father and mother and the two shall become one. Paul says this is the great mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. This union is the mystery that's been revealed. And that's who we are. Not only are we individually the most holy place, but together we're built up into the most holy place. For, one, for by one spirit we were all immersed and mingled into one single body. God has carefully designed each member and placed it in the body to function as he desires. You are the body of the anointed one, and each of you is a unique and vital part of it. I want you to look at this. So you are the body. And then each of you is unique. There's an interesting thing about the word you. So in the Western mindset, I know we, we think this, when, we, when we're praying and reading, we tend to have, and we're reading scripture especially, they think we feel like the Lord's speaking directly to us. And he is. But you is also very often plural in scripture. So the you are the body is a plural you in this, when you look it up. Now, that's when he says, and then he says, each of you, so now he's made it a singular, is a unique and vital part of it. But the body, you, is a plural um, perspective. So what would happen if we began to read scriptures from a perspective of union and the body? One body. So one spirit, one body. Let me, let's go back to our scripture or that um, we use part of our theme for this, and it's Psalms 1-3. I think it was on our bumper video, or the promo video. It says, we'll be planted like a tree by a stream, and that our leaves won't wither, we'll bear fruit in every season, and we'll prosper in everything we do. That tree needed everything around it. To accomplish that, it needed the water, it needed the soil, it needed the sun, it needs the wind, it needs everything around it. And that's the way we are. We need everything around us to be everything that the Lord's called us to be. If our mind shift switches and we begin to see ourselves as one with Him, one body. It just becomes impossible to compare. Why would we compare ourselves when we're one? Why would we compare ourselves when we're one with the incomparable one? This has been such a transformation in my life. It doesn't mean that, like, just like I read the res resume last week, it doesn't mean that I don't compare sometimes, but I don't get on the hamster wheel. And I go to the truth, and I said, I'm not doing that anymore. That does not belong here. So the Lord told me, he says, Robin, you are one, and one is enough. And that's what I stand on. When we understand and see how valuable we are, we won't compare. Instead, we will become treasure hunters, looking for the beauties in others. Because the enemy's strategy has always been division. 
Now, this is the most exciting part of this message for me. And I was hoping I'd get time to it, and I do. It's always, he has lots of, he has lots of strategies to derail us and stuff, but his end game is division. He does not want us to know that we're one with each other, with him, because there's power in one. The power of one. In Genesis chapter 11, have y'all all heard of the Tower of Babel story? And I read that, and this is a people that are trying to come together and do something with the wrong agenda. They want to isolate, build big walls, big strong tower, make a name for themselves. But it's interesting, and in that particular story, the Lord comes down. So important that the Lord comes down, and he says, is, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. This is a spiritual principle. When we're one, nothing will be impossible for us. 1 Timothy 3.15, we are God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. He calls us, his church, the body, the pillar and foundation of truth. Pillars and foundations are what? They're there to bear weight. And the Lord has declared that he, when Jesus left and he prayed in 17, um, Luke, John 17, he says, the Lord, the, the glory you gave me I've been given them. We have been created as a body to bear the weight of his glory. And when we're one, we're together, we have an ever-increasing glory. There's nothing that will be impossible to the body of Christ as we come together and we see ourselves as one. And we stop the comparison. Because what does comparison do? It stops us from saying yes and seeing the fruitfulness on the other side of yes, it keeps us held back. It stops us from celebrating others, like Lindsay said, because we're so focused on our lack. The enemy loves to keep us feeling not enough, pulled back, and not understanding that our strength comes in our oneness. Ephesians 3.10 says, His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purposes that he accomplished in Christ Jesus. God's intent is for the world to know kingdom realities through his body, through us as one body. He wants them to know his nature, his heart, his good plans for them, his grace, and his love. It's God's intent that now and I love that word there now. And you can take it two ways. In that particular passage in Ephesians 3, the entire context before that, when God is talking about he's removed the dividing wall, we're one now. He says, the, if the mystery's been revealed, I've removed the division, you are now one people. And he says, now, it's my intent that through this church that my multifaceted wisdom will be made known. That's the power of one. So ladies, we are one, and one is enough. If you have a tendency to compare, I want you to take your little card, and I want you to cross it out, and I want you to replace it with one is enough. One is enough is not true with french fries and cookies, <laughs> <laughs> sip of coffee. It's, it, it's just not enough. But in this situation, in the, the heavenly perspective of who we are and what we've been called to do, one is enough. You are enough. You're complete. You're full. You have an abundance. You're acceptable. You're not lacking in anything. You're not insignificant. You're valuable. He has made you the most holy place because of his union with you. So here's what we're going to do to wrap this up. I said I felt like the Lord wanted to do something among us. Oftentimes in Scripture, there's a physical demonstration of a spiritual reality. And on the way to um, Jerusalem, every year before they went over for the Passover feast, the God's people would sing a song. It's called a song of ascent. So when they were going up to Jerusalem, they would sing it. 
So in just a minute, I'm going to ask all of us to stand. And we're going to re repeat that song. We're not going to sing it. We're going to repeat that song together. But here's what I like to do. I want everyone in the room connected. You can hold hands. You can link arms. You can do a full body side hug. You can just do shoulder to shoulder. I want some, every one of us to be connected. So you mother hens out there, look around and make sure everyone here is connected. <laughs> this is going to be a physical demonstration of a spiritual principle in our lives. We are one and we are at our most powerful when we are one. Yeah. So if you would, take a stand, get linked up. Okay, I had in my notes to ask y'all not to say anything because <laughs> I knew this would happen, but it worked out well. We just cannot connect and not talk, right? It's just impossible. So this is a physical demonstration of what God's done for us. This is the remedy of comparison. You see yourself as one with him and in one body. Those thoughts, those feelings of not enough, you're just going to say, that does not belong here. It just doesn't. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to repeat. The, I'm going to say this psalm, and then you're going to repeat it. But let me tell you a little bit about the psalm. It's talking about unity, and it's talking about how good and pleasant it is when we live together in unity. And they make two comparisons. It's like the oil that flows down on the head of the priest, down onto the beard, down onto the robe. And it also talks about the dew that's on top of the largest mountain in Israel, and when it, the dew or the snow caps melted, it's what just flooded the entire land with refreshing water. And then it says, because it's in this place, this place of unity, this place of the body, that the Lord commands his blessing. So y'all repeat after me. How good and pleasant it is, good and pleasant it is. when God's people... Live together, in unity. live together in unity. It is like precious oil, like precious oil. Poured, on the head. poured on the head. That's a symbol of anointing and glory. We need the glory on you. We need the glory on each other. We need to be together, be unified, and the glory on you is what I need, and you need the glory on me. It is like poured on the head, Running down, on the beard, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on, Aaron's beard. Down on the collar of his robe. Down on the of his robe. It, is as if it is as if the dew of Hermon, dew of Hermon were, falling on Mount Zion. were falling on Mount Zion. We are Mount Zion. We are the church. For there the Lord bestows, there the Lord bestows his blessing. Even life, even life forevermore. This is what we're called to do. We're called to know that we are one. Yeah. Our work is to believe that we are one. And through that union, just like Jenny said last night in John 15, that's where our fruit comes from. That's where our accomplishments come from. And it's beautiful to set up that way because now the Lord gets the glory. Yeah. We're just co-laborers with him. So let me close this in prayer. Father, we thank you that your word is said that we are one and one is enough. Lord, we take that, we believe it, and when comparison types to come in, we say, no, we've plucked that up at the root, we've cast it into the sea, and it has obeyed us. And we have an understanding that when we're one, we do not have to compare. It's impossible to compare one. In Jesus' name, amen.